Hello and welcome to In the Envelope, an awards podcast from Backstage. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to give you a front row seat to the industry's most exciting awards races. Who is in the running? How can you, listener, win a statue of your own? What makes awards worthy film, television, and theater? We're sitting down with some very talented actors to get that insider's perspective on these questions and more, and maybe, just maybe, we'll get a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I am never more at ease Mm. and in my element as I am when I am on stage. I just think it is... It's just the greatest gift to get to do a play, especially great plays. And I have done some great writing. And so, and that's for me, the writer is king or queen. You know, that's where it all comes from. This is our final episode of our mini season dedicated to this year's Tony Awards, to the 2018 Tony Awards. The ceremony is happening on June 10. Broadcast live from Radio City Music Hall, hosted by Sarah Bareilles and Josh Groban. Don't miss it. It's a very short season of theater episodes, but if you, listener, if you think that we are done pumping out podcast episodes, intimate interviews with brilliant artists who are sharing their actorly wisdom, you are wrong. We have a lot more episodes coming up because Emmy season is upon us. Award season is just a year-round thing. So you will not have to wait very long for our next episode. Keep your ears open. Uh, But in the meantime, wrapping up this Tony season is Denise Goff, uh, who stars as Harper in Tony Kushner's Angels in America, which is playing now on Broadway in a production directed by the great Marianne Elliott, transferred from the National Theatre in London. What do you need to know about Angels in America? It's a classic. It's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Tony Kushner won all the awards in the book for it when it premiered on Broadway about 25 years ago. The reason you can tell it's a classic and it's amazing is that it's still relevant today. It's an incredibly timely piece as Denise and I kind of scratched the surface of the many themes that are relevant that make this revival timely, particularly Nathan Lane is playing Roy Cohn, one of the play's real life figures, uh, who is a kind of a notorious attorney and fixer uh, who is also, as it happens, a mentor to Donald Trump, who uh, is, I don't know if you know, currently the president of the United States. Denise and I did not get into that, but we did talk about the transfer from London to the U.S. We talked a lot about the fascinating character of Harper. Um, It's very much a rich, rewarding role for an actress. Uh, Mary Louise Parker played it in the original and in the HBO adaptation. She won both a Tony and an Emmy. Jeffrey Wright, friend of this podcast, also was in Broadway and in the HBO version, also won a Tony and an Emmy. It's the kind of show that tends to gra- awards tend to gravitate towards it. So it's very fitting that Denise has joined us on the show. This is happening just the week after Nathan Lane appeared on our on Backstage's cover just last week. It's a very exciting time. If you're in New York, be sure to see it. It is two four-hour productions. Millennium Approaches is part, is part one and Perestroika is part two. I'm excited to go check it out again. Any single section of this interview, honestly, could be taken out and mined for brilliance and for actorly wisdom and for inspiration. Denise Goff didn't hit it big until she was about 35 years old in Duncan McMillan's People's Places and Things. That was directed by Jeremy Heron, who kind of gave her her family and her her big start. Uh, we talked a lot about specifically that show, but also kind of what that changes in an actor and the very pivotal moment, the crisis of faith she was having as an actor beforehand. But gosh, if Denise isn't someone who just sticks to her guns and knows exactly who she is and exactly what she wants and needs on stage and very much articulated what makes great acting and the many different performances, the many different things that you as an actor have to be thinking about as you are very much yourself on stage, but very much playing a character and very much keeping in mind the many factors in play there. For anyone who has stage fright, this is a terrific interview. For anyone who's starting an acting career later in life, this is a terrific interview. I just got to shut up. We got to get to it. Let's take a quick break and then get to, yeah, this incredible interview with Denise Goff. (laughs) 
Denise Goff is one of today's most exciting theater actors on both London and New York stages. She moved from her native Ireland to London at a very young age to pursue acting, and worked for years before hitting it big with Duncan Macmillan's People, Places, and Things, which won her her first Laurence Olivier Award. Her second was for the National Theatre's revival of Tony Kushner's Angels in America, directed by Marianne Elliott a production that is now transferred to Broadway and earned a record-breaking number of Tony nominations. Here it is, our interview with the brilliant Tony nominee, Denise Goff. Denise, thank you so much for joining us. You're so welcome, Jess you... Mart. Can you first, um, thank you. I love yours too. However, I might need a little bit of help. Okay. How do you pronounce your last name? Goff. Denise Goff. Rhymes with cough. Uh, Yesterday I was introduced by a man that is just this lovely, lovely man. He said, have you met Denise Go? And I was like, oh God, I don't want to. Go. I really like him. So I don't want to correct him. But it's Goff. Yeah. 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 Vincent I really Bango. have that problem with Jack Smart. Jack Smart is quite difficult to get wrong. Yeah, Jack Smart is a very, it's like an 80s <laughs> film star. It's a bit like, um, yeah, Jack Smart. Yeah, you could be like the born identity or something like that. <laughs> sure. Jack Smart, yeah, you're wow. actually like a, like a, one of those Matt Damon type. Mm. Matt Damon would play you mm-hmm. I'm, I'm in the movie. I'm so down. <laughs> of I'm your so life. down. In the three, in the sequels, in the three I part movie of your life. Yeah. It's like <laughs> Jack Smart. Yeah, That's what it, is. it implies action. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The character, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Now, if only I can just get over the sound of my own voice as a podcast host, oh, then we'll get there. Yeah, know? I'm the same. Every time I hear my yeah, <laughs> is that right? Every time I hear my voice, and I'm hearing it a lot at the moment. I'm so. Sure. Is that true um, of film and TV stuff as well? Yeah, I watched a film I've got coming out at the end of the year, and I watched mm. myself. And I'm not supposed to be particularly attractive in it, but when you see yourself <laughs> not being attractive, it's uh, like, oh God, why does my mouth do that thing? Totally. There's nothing you can do about it. Totally, it's those exact kind of comments of like, only you would know the mouth yeah, thing that you're talking exactly. about. Exactly, like, and some people might, might find it charming, but I right. look at it and go, why do I look like that? So yeah, yeah, we don't want to be going down that rabbit hole though. So um, <laughs> right, yeah, cut to me in ten years, my face will be completely frozen. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not the, that's, that's beside the, the end point for actors. Of that. Yeah, don't interesting do that. work. Well, I think of you as a transformative actor. So thanks. That's cool to hear that you, even when you're watching yourself fully transformed, you're like. Well, that's why I love theater because it's I don't yeah. have to watch it. <laughs> I don't totally, to, yeah. I don't have to look. At, because I watch everything I do. It's the same. I read every review. I've always done that really? my whole life. I've never had a... And then when I'm filming things, if I'm allowed to, I will watch the take and then say, yeah. I want to do that. Like, I'm, mm-hmm. I can be quite objective uh, about it. But theatre is so fantastic for me because mm. it once it's done, it's done. Like, I saw the pictures of... I did a show last year in St. Anne's Warehouse and <laughs> they were trying to choose pictures for the press. Oh, yeah. It's all and over those Dumbo. those pictures yeah. were intense. Like, the pictures of when I'm actually performing, you know, you look at mm-hmm. these pictures and you think, like, them bulging veins in my neck and I'm constantly <laughs> shouting. And yeah. I was like, yeah, good luck getting a pretty one. <laughs> so exactly. all of them to are just, yeah. yeah. Susan Feldman was like, look, we're just going to go with the really intense ones. I was yeah. really proud of her for doing that. Because you were playing a drug addicted actor yeah actress yes, actress yes yeah, actress I call myself an actress yes indeed we can the get feminists into feminists are already up in well. arms I can hear it <laughs> but I have my reasons depends on the feminists but yeah. yes I, I am one as well you are yes you are a feminist and you are an actress yeah I yeah. think it's powerful to call yourself an actress. Mm-hmm. I, I do. I know that linguistically it's a diminutive. The ESS is diminutive. But mm. I said in an interview once, you know, I'd be no less afraid of a lioness than a lion. I don't see why yeah. being, you know, also I'm not, I, I'm, we're at the beginning of the conversation about gender parity and Hopefully. all of this. So I'm not, I'm mm-hmm. not being paid the same as a man or I don't feel like... I get treated in the same way as a man doing mm-hmm. this job. So I, I, I don't, I, I, and also I play women. I don't, I don't, right. it seems strange to me to be called a female actor because that feels like it's mm. saying I'm a female, very, like that the main 
thing is male and then I'm a female version totally, of it. Totally, totally. So that's strange to me. Right. I mean, if you want to say male actor and female actor, but that just seems like such a mouthful. I as well I, say male actress and female actor. Yeah. Like they should just switch them up like that. Well, I just feel like for me, what I do is different than what a man does in terms yeah. of... You know, somebody said to me, they got very angry and they said, if you were a doctor, you wouldn't say you were a doctress. And I said, yeah, but it's not gender specific at all to be a doctor. My sister's a doctor. Um, Mm. But it is, my job is, I identify myself. I know there's um, all sorts of amazing um, conversations about what you identify as, uh, but I identify as a female. So so I feel like it's very important to me to claim that. I play women, Mm -hmm. you know. And I'm really proud of playing women. Totally. I feel like we are only diminishing ourselves by saying that we shouldn't call ourselves actresses. Sure. There's sure. also a great history behind actresses. They were fabulous. I I watched them. Um, I was at an event last night because I'm now running to be pr- uh, running for presidency of the United States. Oh, it feels congratulations. Like, because I have been nominated for a Tony. Um, so I'm completely. being invited. I'm to- so glad you announced your candidacy on this podcast. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you go to, I'm going to everything. So it's amazing. I'm going yeah. to all these incredible events and they were honoring Cheetah Rivera. And mm-hmm. <laughs> that made me more proud than I have ever been to be an Just, actress. Yeah. Because you watch what that woman did throughout her career and does. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. There's something deeply female about her sure. that I love. Well, and just today they announced that Ruth Naga will be playing Hamlet, the title role of Hamlet. Fantastic. In, I believe in Dublin, in Ireland somewhere. Yes, good for her. Yeah. Ruth Naga. Ruth Naga. Yeah. Yes. I'm Are helping you, out with all the pronunciations all the of all names. my Irish sisters. <laughs> do you know? Do you know her? Do you know her? Well, everyone? we've met a couple of times, but I, we're, it's a very small pool. I yeah. mean, I, I. I don't work in Ireland very much. I have mm. a couple of times, but I left there when I was very young. So my career really, even mm. though I, I bulk when I'm called British, actually, mm. I feel like an honorary Brit because it gave right. me my career. London mm. was the place that taught me and raised me and uh, really looked after me creatively. And so... Sure. Well, and I want to ask about that because, it, uh, first of all, what was what did happen? What When did you leave home and why... And what do you mean by London kind of took care of you? Well, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> I know, London, well, first of all, it kicks the shit out of you. And then once mm-hmm. you prove that you're not going anywhere, it sort of embraces you, which I think is what New York does a little bit to oh, you yeah. or any oh, big yeah. city. Yeah. Um, no, I left home when I was 15. I kind of was, I don't know, the ro- romantic version is that I ran away to London to be an actress. But mm-hmm. but actually, I ran away with a boy and I kind of <gasps> thought I was in a movie. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then oh, I got yeah. to London and thought, oh, shit. <laughs> but I'm very stubborn and so I didn't uh, go back. So I, I sort of became a woman in London. Sure. And so when I say it took care of me, it taught me like it's where I worked and where I, it gave me a scholarship to drama school. It's, I have mm. lots of uh, kind of opinions on uh, great, an actress with opinions. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I have, lots I, like of, yeah, <laughs> I have lots of... Uh, thoughts and stuff about immigration because you know I'm a white English speaking immigrant mm-hmm. and so London mm-hmm. took me in it gave me job seekers allowance it let me have I got a scholarship to drama school it paid my rent like all of that stuff I was I was treated very well as an immigrant mm. um, and yet and yet and yet um, anyone who's not white and English speaking as an immigrant doesn't seem to have the same luxury afforded them mm-hmm. and I just feel like I always want to speak out and say that if you give to an immigrant if you Mm. support an immigrant I mean this whole city is built by immigrants Um, if you do that uh, we give back we're really hard Mm -hmm. workers you know there's some of that in Angels in America as well well for me more than ever now with this play it's about um, you know Harper says I finally figured out the secret of all that Mormon energy is devastation That's what makes people migrate and build things. Mm. Devastated people do it, people who have lost love. And I always think of all those people who leave countries that they have to leave and Mm. then they go and they build lives for themselves. It's incredible. And then there's also a speech that Pryor says that I'm on stage, I can hear it every night. And uh, it talks about people in a boat waiting while unsmiling, implacable men sees maybe you, maybe the person next to you, and with no warning at all, with time only for a quick intake of breath, you are pitched into freezing, turbulent water and salt and darkness to drown. And I think that is happening 
to all those people in those boats from Syria yeah. and all over the world that all are trying world. to get to Every safety. Yeah. So, um, so Angels in America has a powerful resonance now for me around themes of immigration and um, sure. and the other and all of that mm-hmm. stuff. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back to London, going back to the early days, mm-hmm. you were you really were sixteen. Yeah, I was At 15 first. when I left home, and oh then gosh. I was 16, just turned 16 when I got to London. And is it true you were one of 11? I'm one of 11 children, yes. Amazing. So you can see why I ended up on stages. Aha. <laughs> uh-huh. right? And was that at all, there's no, like, acting in the family or anything? No, no, no. I mean, my aunt came to see me last week, and she's so sweet. She was somebody who, when I was 17, she lived in London, and she took me to the Royal Shakespeare Company. Oh, cool. And I mean, I was this little waif of a thing, you know, and... um always wanted to be an actress and she made me talk to the actors after the show oh. and the actor that I wound up speaking to went to the drama school that I then got a scholarship oh. to study in and and 10 years later when I did a play at in Ireland she sent me a framed poster of that night that she had kept for 10 uh, years uh, and, uh, that's so cool but she came to see show? me last week we saw what did we see The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe oh, cool. and she came to see me last week here and um and she was like god it's uh yeah it's huge what has happened for me is huge yes, you know full it's, circle yeah it's absolutely huge that i have wound up she was the one that always believed you know even when everybody else was saying i'm a disaster <laughs> she said she's going to do mm-hmm. uh, good stuff and and she knew to put you directly in contact with actors yeah, themselves yeah. Well, only that one time. I mean, she worked mm. in a bank. She wasn't connected to it. But she she's most impressed by me because she's like, you right. had no contacts sure. in this whole business. You had no contacts. And I didn't. I had no idea how to go about any of this. So, oh, wow. yeah. That's always very I, impressive. It's always very impressive to me. And it's it's that, it begs the question, like, how do you do it? Like, how do, what do you recommend to people who are moving to London at age 15? Well, first of all, I don't know. Like, I don't really... Because people ask that, like, do you have any advice? And I think, God, if I had had advice myself, I don't know if I would have taken it. I don't think you should be Mm. listening to anyone's advice when you're 16. You should be making a mess of everything and then finding a way through it. Um, Sure, advice might have altered your path and the path is Yeah, but I knew that I had to work and I had to work hard. And uh, Mm. that was in anything. Like, I I had lots and lots and lots of jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, I'm so grateful to my parents for instilling a really strong work ethic Absolutely. into me because you know even when I became what people would see as successful as an actress I would do plays in the West End but then two weeks later I'd be working as a waitress like okay. serving people who yeah. had seen me on stage two oh. weeks previously and and I'm really grateful for all of that now too because mm. it keeps you have to keep eyes on yourself in this business mm. especially like what I'm experiencing now in New York like it could be so easy to get into the kind of wild circus of it all and actually it's always just about the work Mm. you know you have to keep an eye on why you're doing it and Mm -hmm. um no resting on your laurels yeah and also not believe in your own heart like my sister's a heart surgeon like come on (laughs) what i do is there's no doubt storytelling is important and i am a huge believer that the arts are the thing that would lead us out of the darkness like you know i really truly believe that but it's a privilege to work in the arts it really is and so to have any sense of like entitlement about it for me is Mm. um you know work hard and be decent to people Mm. but also like as a woman i would say you know know your power too like we mm-hmm. have a habit women of kind of deferring still sure and and kind of not wanting people to be intimidated by talent or mm. uh you know not wanting to cause too much i think yeah. you know you have to really know what you're capable of um it's like I always think of if a plumber came to my house and fixed my toilet and I said to that plumber, that's a really great job. And the plumber said, well, no, actually, it's not. I had, <sighs> I did a really good one last week or it's really nothing. <laughs> right. You'd be deeply unimpressed with the plumber, right? <laughs> right. But as actresses, right. we are sort of, we do this kind of defer this kind of oh it's nothing it's nothing sure. well it's not nothing mm-hmm. just you know i i am where i am now as a result of really hard work and um mm. 
and like you said, the 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 mess and the mistakes, like that. Yeah, totally. That is totally what makes you. Yeah, and and thinking you you've made it at a certain point, and then it all going and mm. like all of that stuff. You know that that's what. Um, like I, when I witness somebody very young getting a lot of adulation and success, yes. I always think, "Oh God, here comes a monster." Oh, I mean, yeah, it's so easy to become one. That, yeah, that way. yeah, because you start to believe that what we do is. Uh, it's like I said, what we do is a privilege. It's such a privilege to get to mm -hmm. to be allowed to tell stories as your job. Right. You know, it's Anyone my job gets to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's an it's incredible privilege. privilege. Yeah. And it is, it's certainly something to be enjoyed, but you got to keep it in perspective. That Absolutely. This perspective, is not a heart surgery podcast. Yeah, yeah. For example. I mean, I could give you one of those, though, because I know a lot about well, heart you, surgery. Well, you know about, like, <laughs> emotional heart surgery. <laughs> Very <laughs> nice, Jack. Smart. Smart you by name. You perform emotional smart heart surgery nature. every night on stage in yeah. this show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess I do. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to we angels in a minute. Oh, I want to... <clears throat> there's so much to unpack in angels. Even It's funny that you mentioned the immigration because I feel like it's, it's one on a list of themes that Tony Kushner's tackling yeah. in the show that he yeah. somehow embeds into it. But um, but I still want to know how did you get all the way to the point of that show you mentioned at St. Anne's, which is people, places, things. Mm -hmm. Is it safe to say that was kind of the big break? That changed my life. You know, yeah. it, we were talking earlier about this podcast, my friend's podcast, and we recorded that just after I had auditioned for People, Places, and Things. But and not I, booked it. I had just got it. And what a pivotal. Moment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I'm sat talking with my friend, and and he um. You know, he was asking me about the previous couple of years and I hadn't worked for 13 or 14 months. I was so broke, okay. like beyond broke. Mm. It was like, oh, my God, I'm 35 and I'm surviving on 40 pounds a week, which is like $60 or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I had Gosh. reached a really beautiful point with it all where when you're out of work for that long, you kind of, well, I had to kind of do emotional heart surgery on myself and, and realize, it, was it worth it? You know, is it worth this kind of, I had had, I was auditioning for some TV thing that I hated. Sure. I mean, I just thought, oh God. Your standards lower when you're in a drought, yeah, right? Yeah, and you, and if I had got that TV part, that's the thing I would have become known for and I would have had no pride in it and, mm. but I would have had lots of money. And um, hmm. I remember thinking that, if they give me this, I'm going to have to do it. And yeah. I felt really uncomfortable about that. Mm. I felt like, where is my power in all of this? There you, know? you go. Yeah. So then I spoke to a friend of mine, Michael Murphy, who's a brilliant, beautiful, talented actor and director. And he taught me how to conduct a, like a master class or um, mm. a class in universities, an acting class. And so I went to a university. I was so nervous. And I went and I worked with 12 students and I did his master class oh, okay. and I mm. loved it yeah that and must I, have been I loved it and I remember leaving and I thought oh, I'm going to be a teacher that's okay. what I'm going to do yeah. so I was really sad that I maybe was not going to be an actress anymore sure. but I felt so empowered that I had found something else yeah. that I really loved I really loved working with those students mm -hmm. um, and then I think a few days later I auditioned for people, places and things. And there was a month between the first audition and the second audition. And on the day of the second audition, they offered me. Was it a, a month role. between because they were going through a bunch of other options? or No, they had gone through so many people. They had seen so oh, many gosh. people. And then oh, they finally... <laughs> Yeah, I was way down on the uh, third tier or the fourth tier. Um, did you know anyone involved in the production? Or? I knew Jeremy, the director. I had okay. done one day uh, of work with him Interesting. years previous, but I didn't know any. I mean, I knew the National Theatre and I knew I wanted to work there, but they had not auditioned me for many, many years. And so okay. I thought I had a bit of a reputation because, you know, like I said earlier, I, I, I have... Um, I'm quite demanding, mm -hmm. you know, uh, well, it's that. when I work. Mm -hmm. um, and I am quite, I can be quite intense about the work and mm -hmm. that doesn't suit a lot of people. Sure. And so I thought, well, maybe... My reputation. My reputation. Which I, is I a have, thing. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, but you see, I have this thing that if you don't stay true to yourself and be those demanding things and all of that, then your tribe have no way of finding you. So if if uh -huh. I don't keep 
speaking my truth, mm. then there's no way of anyone finding me. And the people that have finally found me, like Jeremy and Duncan and mm. the cast of People, Places and Things, like the very fact that I'm rigorous in my work and I demand that the people work, working opposite me show up in Absolutely. the way that I do. Mm. And I get annoyed if they don't. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the that meant I was able to do that performance, you know. Yes, that's where that's that came they from. from you. Yes. So, so as much as you know, I had my kind of oh God, maybe I'm just too difficult. I mean, mm-hmm. men never ask themselves that question. Maybe exactly. I'm difficult. And I think the reputation thing isn't quite as strong. It's just for men. not. No. Women are told you're difficult, or like I now, whenever I hear of somebody being described as a diva or difficult, I always think, was she that, or was she mm-hmm. just asking for her needs to be met, mm-hmm. and people didn't like it. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so my agent had called the national, and they said no. I just had fallen out of their off their radar, which oh, also happens. Right. Okay. Um, and so I auditioned for People, Places, and Things, and um, it, there was a month in between because I had gotten a TV job, which was <laughs> which was great because the dates on this TV job kept changing, and so they kept having to increase my money. So this job oh, kept okay. <laughs> this little job turned into, and I met some fantastic people on it. I remember working with this actor Larry Lamb, um, who we were sitting in a graveyard getting ready to do a scene, and I had auditioned for People, Places, and Things, and I was like, God, I'd really love to get it. Mm. And he was like, Oh God, I hope you get it, darling. It's going to be great. And then when I got it, like mm. those guys on that show were all part of, they had been there when I was like, fuck, I really, yeah. if I don't get this play, then I'm done. I'll yeah. just go and teach. Oh, see, that um, is that turning point. Yeah, yeah, it really was. It was a place of surrender. That's It's it's your surrender point. But that place of surrender must have been, you must have brought that into that audition and that maybe yeah, the kind of like I didn't beg for nothing the to part. lose thing yeah. is, is what got you the role. Yeah, I mean, I also, I mean, I destroyed the room. I upturned tables, <laughs> knocked over chairs, <laughs> snorted icing sugar. I mean, I really went for it. But then at the yes. end of it, I said, good luck with your process of finding this woman. Mm. And I walked out mm. and I saw the names of two other actresses on the list, both of whom I knew. Uh-huh. And I thought, those two are good women. It could go to any one of us. And then months later, when I was doing the show, Jeremy said, oh, no, they were on their first audition and you were on your second on audition. The second. Oh, and I was okay. the only person they saw twice. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. Yeah. So it completely changed my life it is it's that combination of like on the one hand you're having almost a crisis of faith where you're considering going into another related realm you're completely broke and Mm. you're you work survival jobs as well right like oh my god you mentioned waitressing and all the time yeah but then you also have the thing where you're not going to stop sticking to your guns and you stop being yourself no way I can't, you know, I remember at drama school, I, when I arrived at drama school, I had really long blonde hair and I uh, look a certain way and I, hmm. really pretty. Um, <laughs> and uh, my first part was Irina in, th- no, was uh, Alison in Look Back in Anger. And then my oh. second term, I was cast as Irina in Three Sisters and I didn't agree with the casting because mm. I didn't want to play Arena. I had already played a woman similar to Arena in Allison, and I could mm. see what was starting to happen was I was the girl with the long blonde already hair who type. would shake a f-ing snow globe in the corner. So I went mm. home and I shaved my head. Okay. And the next day Just I was to allowed to play people. Natasha in Three Sisters and then I was cast in really interesting roles Go because on, I made okay. it very clear that this this job that I'm doing it's not about vanity it's about mm. it's about playing the, the best yeah. best women and that's interesting too that long blonde hair just denotes something for people yeah well it's easy you know you have to be i i feel like you have to be really careful of well i have to be i can't speak for anyone else for some people it mm. works beautifully and i wish and in ways i was like god i wish i was just one of those really easy mm. actresses who got on with everybody and <laughs> who just didn't challenge anyone because maybe I would have worked a lot more or, but I I can't do no, that. No regrets. No, right? absolutely no. not. Absolutely not. Because now I'm getting to a point in my career where I get to choose uh, what I do. Yes. And that is all I ever wanted. That's where all the power is. And if it all falls apart tomorrow over here, um, mm. you know, I go and I find Jeremy Heron and and Duncan McMillan and we work together yeah, for the rest cool. of my life. So I'm set now. That's <laughs> all wonderful. of this is bonus, you know. Mm-hmm. Of course. You found that family. You yeah, found that tribe. Family. Yeah. The tribe that aren't afraid when I lose the plot every now and then because, you know, 
Mm. Somebody's <laughs> behaving like oh, an interesting. Ass. And are they were they the tribe mostly because of your artistic sensibilities just aligned, but also just because of the pivotal nature of this just career trajectory changed from one. Well, I mean, it, they really. Jeremy is a very brilliant man um, because he's a very good man. Like, uh, good is not the right word. He is. Jeremy cares about his family first, right? So mm. his life comes first and then the work comes after mm. it. Like when we were preparing to take people places and things to uh, to St. Anne's, yes. we had two weeks rehearsal and I said, are we going to work on weekends? And he said, and this is one of the reasons why I really love him. He said, well, no, we're all about to leave our families and stuff. So we should spend the weekends with our families. And I thought that is why... Hmm. I love you and it, it because life has to be more important than work for me I uh, you mm-hmm, know mm-hmm. I don't want my whole life to be because uh, I remember saying to my father when I was really young I would say to him I want to be an actress I just want to be an actress I just want to be an actress and he said you're somebody's daughter you're somebody's sister you're yeah. somebody's friend you're somebody's aunt all of these things mm-hmm. and I couldn't hear him Sure. Because all that mattered to me was being an actress. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But if all that matters to me is being an actress, that means that the power lies with all the people who can give me jobs. Oh, interesting. Uh, okay. Cause so I don't want to give those people my power. Yeah, well, there's that. And I also thought it was the other thing of like, if you're only focusing on being an actor, then you're an actress. I'm mm-hmm. so sorry. Yeah, if you're only focusing on being an actress and not on a hu- on being a human being, then how can you play human beings? Because yeah, you have totally. to draw from some kind of... Which is also for me about where, you know becoming very successful very young is like I've lived Mm. a very full life before this kind of material success has happened and so Hmm. I know the world Mm. uh, and I've had massive struggle in my life and so um I sometimes can see if somebody if if somebody gets successful too young the very thing that made them successful diminishes because Mm the kind of it doesn't grow anymore like life grows your Mm. your craft I Mm -hmm. think life does not just work like Mm. the world being out in the world and sometimes you just see you see it like with musicians and stuff all those musicians who Mm. died like there's this brilliant Elizabeth Gilbert does this great TED talk about the pressure we put on artists yes but the second like the second album thing and Mm -hmm. um, and how she sees us as like we're conduits for something bigger so we have to stop believing that we are in control of it you know so you Mm. so we make stars out of people so like let's use Amy Winehouse as an example Mm -hmm. her talent what she was able to do we lauded her we threw her up in the air Mm -hmm. and then she became so successful that when you watch that documentary she didn't know how Mm. to really deal with what Mm -mm. was happening no who could yeah Yeah. and so then everybody turns on her Mm -hmm. and so like it's sort of like you have to protect Mm. your art from material success I think yeah you know you really do sometimes I've made some of my greatest like you have to remember too that when I first did People Places and Things Nobody knew that it was a life changer. I didn't know until the mm. opening night when the entire audience stood up. Oh, I thought oh. something has happened to you. I see. But I but still didn't know then. there was a transfer. I didn't know no. that New York was going to happen. But it was just a beautiful play that I was getting to do. Mm-hmm. I was still quite broke. You know, <sighs> sure. I was still struggling. And for rehearsals, you're just wor- focused on the work and totally. not on the audience. Response. So I was making my best work when I mm. was on the bones of my arse <laughs> you know like <laughs> yeah. it was um, the struggle is sometimes the place that you make the most beautiful mm. stuff so I always just try and keep a bit of the struggle it yes. had to happen this way if this is the only way that any of this could have happened absolutely absolutely. and I, if it had happened for me at 21 I'd be dead there's no way with the life right. that I'm being thrust into now right. I needed to be nearly 40 to handle it hmm. well that's always really good for Especially for those who want to get into acting later in life, that's always very yeah. Good to but hear. also those who think that it's over, but especially for women, you know. For me, sure. you know, I I feel like we get more and more powerful. You only have to look at someone like Frances McDormand. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to Judith Light earlier at this thing. Oh and, my gosh, Judith yeah, Light, like friend amaz- of the podcast, yeah, amazing women, yeah. you know who 
they're like the ninjas. That's what I call them. If yeah. you stay, if you manage to stick around and get and in this industry, like we're proof that we actually get better with oh, age. Yeah. We've just been sold oh, the lie that we goodness, don't, you know. Yes. So for me to be an advocate of things happening a little later, that's mm. it's a good thing for me to be. Mm. I think, you know, absolutely. Um, you mentioned that this idea of like essentially what it is is a work life balance of like. Of course, in your early days, you're so passionate about acting. You didn't have a single other, you didn't have a plan B. You were all in on acting. Yeah, and I remember, like, at drama school, I would read David Mamet, True and False, and, like, I would refuse to read God, anything I was, non-acting. I was like, I'm yeah. not, I'm not, because, you know, in. there were whole sections on, you know, acting teachers are charlatans and all of that stuff. I And I, uh, I was like, I, he said in it, you can't have a, uh, a backup plan if you're going to do this like yeah. you just can't you a lot need of people to go on this in. podcast have said the same thing yeah you just it, 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 this is a vocation I did um, like this panel yesterday and this wonderful man was saying if you're blessed or cursed to mm. want to do this <laughs> genuinely want to do this like in your bones want to do this then you have to yeah. do it like you have to let it do you you know mm. I, like I, there was never and also you have to remember too that for me it was only theatre like when I met my agent right. I said to her I will never do film and I will never do TV oh cool <laughs> and then after five Absolute. years I was like I am so broke <laughs> I have really got to do film I I've really got to do TV and you, you said no film or TV because you just preferred theatre that's what you I wanted to do I have never I am never more at ease mm. and in my element as I am when I am oh, on stage. Sure. Oh, sure. I just think it is, it's just the greatest gift to get to do a play, especially great plays. And I have done some great writing. And so, and that's for me, the writer is king or queen, you yes. know, that's where it all comes from. Same. Yeah. And so, but now I'm slowly, you know, I'm dancing in the other arenas and realizing, mm. you know, it's a there's great craft and huge amounts to learn and I want to get sure. really good at it and Yeah, yeah. But sure. the stage is Absolutely. The church. It is. <laughs> yes, it's mine. It's my it's very much mine as well. Yeah. But this idea of um uh cultivating a life outside of just acting and, and you know, being a human as well. Mm-hmm. I've been wanting to ask th- specifically Broadway actors, especially when you're on Broadway, you're doing eight shows a week, especially this show, Mm -hmm. Angels in America. Do you have time to do anything other than just the job? Well, at the moment, because I'm running for president of the Tonys. This is a crazy (laughs) particular season. (laughs) This is like, you guys do a season, so I'm going all in. And you had opening and Tony season kind of lumped together. completely. And we do seven shows a week because it's impossible for us to do eight. So we do get two two days off, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, But... And and I try to. It's nice because I um um people are starting to visit me, and that's really good because I get to see New York through their eyes. Because mm. uh, you know when I arrived here, it was the dead of winter. It was Ugh. hardcore, yeah. and it's an intense place to live, Manhattan. I lived in Brooklyn last year, which was much easier oh, cool. for me. I just loved living mm-hmm. in Brooklyn, and um, yeah. uh, so I. I do get to experience I like I tend to go to watch like my friend Florence is a musician and she did a show at BAM the other night mm-hmm. and Florence is I've never seen her in concert and I went and it was like being like having my battery just topped mm. up you know so mm. I tend to go and watch other performers in cool. order that's sort of how I Survive. spend my time yeah I mean that recharging is what you need to yeah and I too. went to Bruce Springsteen last week and that <gasps> cool. was oh my god immense and then I'll see three tall women yeah um, like there's so I, I'm doing as much as I can but I cool. but really the, the greatest gift that this show and the people in it what they have given me is, is like a real lesson in self care mm. there is you cannot I cannot do this job unless I treat myself like an athlete it's mm-hmm. as simple as that mm-hmm. and you wouldn't see Usain Bolt or right. <laughs> any great f- uh, athlete, you wouldn't see them trashing their body before a sure. race. And so it just so happens the races we're running are eight hours long, seven <laughs> times a week. <laughs> right, right. 
so yeah, I I take good care of myself mm-hmm. and I try and rest as much as possible. But you guys don't let us rest when we're nope. running for president. Nope. That's why you gotta be, you gotta be here. <laughs> um, what kind of other self care do you take? You have to take care of your voice. Like, do you drink any well, potions? Or I'm not really. I mean, I'm the worst. I was told at drama school I would never do theater. Oh. <laughs> Look at me now, <laughs> Wenna. Um, yeah. So I, but I I'm quite lax when it comes to. Because somebody said to me, have you had to give up anything like dairy or no, cheese is my very good friend. That's self-care as well. Cheese, if you love it. And burgers. I tried when I was in Brooklyn doing people, place and things. Mm -hmm. I tried veganism for six weeks and I got to week two (laughs) and it was like my body said, if you do not give me a burger, I'm not going on stage. Like I felt my my (laughs) inner personality just split oh, off gosh. and so everything in moderation yeah, I think yeah. but yeah and I meditate that's my major oh, cool. thing so I'm a meditator mm. and that helps and um, and coupled with rest rest and meditation is a rest good meditation I try and do yoga when I have when I have the energy to do it um, yeah. I worked out like I did like uh, core strengthening stuff before the show opened mm. mm-hmm. but the shows themselves keep me pretty fit you oh, know so yeah. Well, and Susan Brown said that um, sometimes on the two show days, she has to decide in the break whether to rest or to keep going, kind of keep your body going and be a yeah. little more active. I mean, and... listen, that woman deserves a Tony for her backstage track alone. Like I have. Oh, gosh. You yeah. just have to. Say, I mean, it's her. ridiculous. Yeah. She is incredible it's and she might have incredible. the most costume changes yeah moment. she does yeah. the most yeah, that's in the show in terms of like breaking it all up and everything she is yeah she's incredible mm. incredible um nathan lane whose backstage cover story comes out this week um was also similarly low-key during our interview because mm. he mentioned just the the emotional and the physical rigors yeah. and i feel like for a show like this is it safe to say that the emotional rigors are physical like you're feeling things yeah. so so acutely that it must manifest in your body yeah totally i mean i definitely i can get this kind of anxiety thing in my stomach sometimes <sighs> when i'm playing harper it's just like oh god i have to go on and do this again because your body doesn't know that it's it's fake, fake exactly yeah. so you're short-circuiting all these this is why it's really important like i do a disrobing thing every night which i think actors should be taught at drama school yes what does that got entail? to well i develop it's a personal thing for myself but like there's you've i've got to come back to ground otherwise mm-hmm. i'm going to sleep with As, this woman yeah who yeah. Is not, I mean, by the two show day, it's great because there's a huge relief for Harper at the end. She finally gets out of this relationship. Mm. Um, Hmm. But taking her home after Millennium is a tricky one. So I just try and just do Hmm. some grounding meditation and stuff so that I'm not... um, because and I remember it was um, actually Claire Van Kampen who she and her husband Mark Rylance came to see me mm. in um, People, Places and Things. And the weird thing was that that sh- in that in the middle of that show, I had said to one of the actors, "I'm going to get my agent to call Mark and ask him to meet me for coffee to talk about how he oh. de-adrenalized himself after mm. doing Jerusalem." Because mm. I had heard that we kept having these comparisons of the size of part and stuff. Oh, cool. And so, and no joke, five minutes after I said that, my company manager came in and said, Mark is in the audience and would like to come up and see you after the show. So he and Claire came up and Claire said about, uh, in the curtain call, you know, I was having, I was kind of leaving the stage with all of this massive energy because you play this part, you have this reaction from an audience and then their reaction just, you're sponging it all up, Oof, you know. Yeah. So so it was them that suggested, you know, finding a ritual that is, you know, because this is all ancient. Storytelling is an ancient art of, yeah. like, it's not, you, like you just said, our bodies don't know that they're pretending, so we must allow them to know at Mm. the end of the night and thank and honor the fact that your body Mm. has gone through this thing because I'm not prepared to give my physical health to a job I'm just not prepared to end up but you know I want to be like Susan you know Susan is 70 and she's able to play all those parts right because her body hasn't gone I'm sorry no way so she must be doing something well in its theater you got to keep going you have another night yeah. Maybe on closing night is when you can really <laughs> yeah. push yourself. Let go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's maybe. interesting, the ritual, and you got to kind of come up with your own yeah. version of that. 
leaving the yeah i mean i'm kind of witchy about the whole thing because i just (laughs) i believe that it's such a spiritual experience acting is such a spiritual experience for me so so i treat it that way and with the respect that i would Mm -hmm. um and people laugh at that and but it works for me so i would never Oh, yeah. You know, there are some people who don't subscribe to that thinking at all about acting, and that's fine. But sure. I do, and sure, it's sure, sure. um, it's like shamanism. You know, you kind of have mm. to just kind of do what works for you Absolutely. as well, and that's what. And is that true me. for pre-show as well? Do you have like a pre-show? No, ritual? I'm terrible pre-show. I'm terrible. I don't do anything. What does that mean? You're terrible. Well, I just don't <laughs> do. I tried to be someone who you know, because you know, Andrew is amazing. Andrew does like. Andrew Garfield. 45 minutes of mm. a warm up before oh. like he prepares that body mm. um, for what it's about to for do a very and physical I am performance. yeah and I'm so impressed with him mm. because I just have never like I remember doing people place and things they had to get somebody to come in and warm us up before the show because I will just talk to people oh wow. so I go down onto the stage and everyone's warming up and I'm just like what have you been doing today? And then it's suddenly the half and I have to go and get ready. <laughs> okay. So, um, hmm. I'm not, I do tend to now myself and James McCardo kind of share, hmm. um, the floor that we're on of dressing rooms and, um, just maybe take a little bit of quiet time. But, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then I say a prayer before the show and then that's it. Hmm. I just open up and say, right, well, whatever you need, tonight this is the body you get tonight whatever I'm exhausted and I don't know <sighs> if I can even get through it but do whatever you need this is the body that you have but you know I had this this thing happen on People Place and Things it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my career and um, on the very opening night the very first preview everyone that worked at the National was in the audience and I stood backstage and I said okay I'm ready um, I said my little prayer and um, mm-hmm. and there was a part of the show where she's on the phone and she's on her own on stage and mm. she has to light a cigarette, smoke the cigarette, snort a line of coke, root through her bag, change the phone from ear to ear and then make this killer joke in the centre of it that demands mm. timing. Mm. So it was mm-hmm. the only part of the show that I was afraid of. Mm. And so I said a prayer beforehand. I said, right, OK, so I'm here and I'm ready and did my little thing. And then I stepped out onto the stage and there's these trap doors in the floor and one of the trap doors broke. So there was a huge hole in the centre of the stage. Oh and so I was thinking, OK, there's a hole over there. Well, I have to continue on. So I continued on through the Chekhov bit. There's a little Chekhov scene at the beginning. And then I went into, and all the while I'm doing all the Chekhov and I'm acting my little socks off. And then so and I'm hole. thinking, don't fall in the hole. Oh Make sure nobody else falls in the hole. Is everybody OK? OK, they've stepped over the hole. I mean, it's amazing. An actor's <sighs> mind is amazing on stage yes. because you can be doing a scene and also having an entire narrative mm. going on. Um, beside it so we get through so I'm continuing on continuing on and then I'm in the phone call Mm -hmm. and I have the phone call and I put the bag on the on the reception desk and then I see the stage manager come on stage and she says I'm sorry we have to stop the show Mm. it's too dangerous to continue and I put the phone down and I said to the audience f**k I was really good in that bit and they all (laughs) clapped and I walked off the stage and I sat down backstage (laughs) and I thought Wow. So then 15 minutes later, it was all fixed. And 15 minutes later, I go back on stage and I said, that's live theatre, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. And I went back into the phone call cool. and the show started. Uh-huh. And um, oh. and that night, the crew member who had basically pulled the wrong lever or something came up to me very upset. And he said, mm. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Mm. And I said, you have given me the greatest gift by doing that because it was like the gods of the theatre were saying, I need you to be completely unafraid in this show. Oh. And at every moment, I need you to be completely un- unafraid. So at the moment that you are most scared of, when mm. you are on your own on the stage, I'm going to crack the stage open <laughs> and the show is going to be stopped and you are going to be fine. And so from that moment on, I have not had an ounce of fear mm. on stage. Ever, because it doesn't matter what happens. In Angels in America, I've had lights fall down, you know, lines not come. It doesn't matter. It just, I just feel like Mm. I can handle anything if I stay open on stage. Mm -hmm. No fear. The stage is no place for fear for me. No, because that worst case scenario, that most terrifying thing almost happened. It happened and you handled it. Yeah, and it happened again in the West End. Something happened and the show had to stop. And again, I turned and I said, I was doing so well. Don't you agree? <laughs> because also, 
I have never subscribed to the thing of like losing yourself in a role like ever right so in people places and things you said this you know somebody said to me god you're just not even there like you're it's not even you and I think that's not true I'm doing the performance and at the same time I could tell you everything that's going on sure so if there's something happening on stage that I need to make sure somebody knows about in the next scene Mm. or this that's why I love theatre because Mm. you are hyper aware yeah so you're in character completely telling a story but this kind of thing of I'm so in it that I can't take care of the other actors on stage yeah. or myself. Sure. That's, um, that doesn't work for me. It's two different kind of narrative planes or maybe it's like 10 or 20 or 30. So many. Yeah. And so one of them many. being like safety. One of them being like make sure that that... Absolutely. Yeah. Like if there's something on the floor or like... Mm-hmm. It happens. <laughs> I used to love like when I would see that something needed fixing and knowing that while I'm doing the scene, I'm also going to fix this thing and nobody's even going to know it. And then afterwards, the stage pressure. managers are like, we just, love you. You're like a cowboy out there. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> totally. The other day, somebody sneezed on, I was seeing a show, somebody sneezed on stage. That is my favorite said, thing. Yeah. And I was like, that's the best. Yeah. It's the best thing ever. It's the same with coughing. Yeah. The same with like, actors get so frightened of life stuff happening yeah. on stage, totally. you know, or I get it a lot if I'm itchy and I'm, I, I, because that's what happens, you know. You just, and as yourself, you just want to live on stage. I remember a woman coming to me when I was on the toilet in the National, um, and asking me (laughs) when I had come up with the idea to have to have tissues uh, during people, places, and things. And I said, "What do you mean?" And she said, "Well, you have these tissues." And I said, "Yeah, because my nose is running because she cries, so I need the tissues." Mm And she just couldn't get her head around <laughs> that it wasn't like a, a specific, it was like... Yeah, capital C choice. Yeah, yeah I yeah. was getting tired of wiping it on my sleeve, so <laughs> I made sure I had tissues in my pocket, you know. Yeah. It's really simple. Yeah. These things are really simple. Yeah. That's such wonderful. You've given us, us such wonderful advice. Oh, my gosh. Um, real quick, too, to, I need to ask one more thing about I've angels. I've completely forgotten we were recording all of this. <laughs> ah, good. Oh, that's a good... <laughs> that's I can't a good, remember um, what I've been saying. <laughs> No, really great things. Literally, it's gonna be so. We have to pick like a twenty minute, the twenty second segment to have as like a promo or like an episode opener. It's gonna be really okay. hard for this episode because oh everything you said is genius. Okay. Um, I was told to ask about Harper, mm-hmm. or I guess your performance in general um, in this show, how it differs from London to New York. Well, it's different because I have a different husband. So, you know, yes. you're reacting to a different actor. Mm-hmm. So um, that's been incredible. And uh, Lee is a fantastic Joe. So, um, yeah, it's been... Yeah, it's different. I mean, we reimagined her costumes and everything. She's very different here. Mm-hmm. I feel like I couldn't get a handle on her in London. Mm. She was very angry. and mm. But also there was differences in the choices of... So I remember... With Russell's Joe, he sort of knew he was gay. And so my reaction to that was to be angry because it felt like, uh, why doesn't he let her go if he knows that he's gay? Do you know what I mean? Whereas Lee's choices are that it doesn't, we're not sure. Like, so Harper's like, is he or is he not? So there's a kind of confusion more. Cool. So she's still trying to make this thing work until it becomes clearer and clearer mm. that she needs to accept that he is gay. Um, so mm. she's more here. I think she's more loving. and But she's, you know, for me, it was really important to play Harper as a woman who's in a very destructive relationship, mm. you know. So... Yeah. And it's quite abusive, yeah. you know, like he doesn't mean to be abusive, but that doesn't mean that he's not being abusive. Yeah. Like that's how the abuse cons- often works. Yeah, yeah. So the lying, the constant lying and also the shaming of her constantly about these pills, oh, you yeah. know, where does she get the pills? <laughs> she gets oh, the pills yeah. from Joe. Totally. So because she's never left the apartment. So hmm. for me, there's like... While I don't, I, I I have found a way for her not to be not so blaming of him, but it's important that I stand her up as a yeah. woman who uh, is allowed to be f-ing angry. Wouldn't mm-hmm. you be like sure. being patronized by this man mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who's telling her it's her fault that right. you know that there's nothing going on? It's gaslighting. It's like it's a really um, uh, subtle and very powerful form of abuse, and mm. so. Um, 
So I didn't want her to just kind of... I mean, Marianne wouldn't have cast me as Harper if she wanted somebody who was just going to, like, suck it up, you know, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. just be devastated by it. I, I, gotcha. I wanted her to be... I mean, I just think she's heroic. I think she is mm. heroic. I think given her background and everything, I remember talking to Tony about it, like there's this kind of misconception that Harper is this sweet little Mormon or that she was ever this sweet little Mormon, mm. but she wasn't. She was like a punk. Mm. Harper was the girl who never fitted in in mm. this Mormon community because she just was just not part of it. Mm-hmm. And um, mm. And my experience of those kinds of women are that they are you know fighters in the end you know yeah the truth will out she's so intelligent um absolutely she's so emotionally intelligent even though she doesn't want to know she knows everything right um and she gets free at the end so it's wonderful and also she Mm. walks away from him not with anger but with a kind of she tells him he needs to go and explore like Because he would come back to her at the end of the play. I always find that ending. I'm like, oh, my God, you will keep her here forever. Yeah. You know, you will do this thing that basically, Harper, you exist because you are my the good side Mm. of me. Mm. And and Tony said, you know, she has to slap him out of that at the end, Mm. that she is more than somebody else's good heart. Mm -hmm. She is a vital, independent human being. Mm. Um, but the only way that she can survive is to get the hell out of Dodge. Oh, yeah. So I'm so proud of her at the end. I just yeah. think it's so brave. Like you said, and it's easier for you to on a two show day to have that arc complete. Oh, yeah, because almost. I get that speech. Yeah, that's wonderful. Mm. What else did you learn from Tony Kushner? I'm, I'm, I can't imagine what it's um, like to work with him. Well, I mean, he didn't really give me many notes. He said mm. one thing that I don't really tell anyone because it's kind of a <laughs> private thing okay. when I was struggling um, about her. And um, mm. uh, But he has always felt that I am doing what he, that's something that he really likes with Harper. So, Wonderful. Um, but that's I've watched need, him really. with others. Yeah, I've watched him with others and they're, you know, I think you see the thing is Harper is so open to emotional interpretation that Mm. he is quite respectful of what that takes to do that, you know, Mm. because there are scenes that are so difficult that I have had to with Marianne like chart like the scene in Brooklyn Heights when she's in the rain and she's like Mm. speaking in poetry. It's poetry. Mm. Um, but you have to ground that That's in tricky. something, you yeah. know, and so you're sh- having to show the audience in my face and in my body because the words are not exactly going to do it. So you have to show them. So mm-hmm. I'm standing front on, you know, showing them what's going on for her. Hmm. Um, so she's a complex creature. Um, but he has only ever always said to me that he's really happy with what I'm doing. And mm. so I'm not going to burrow in and ask him for, <laughs> for anything start, else. Yeah, self-doubting yourself yeah. and start to get in your head about, am I yeah, doing Yeah, there's no right? point. Like, yeah. I just can't do that with my work. Sticking to your guns. You yeah. Gotta, yeah. Yeah. You know who you are. Yeah, and there are people, I'm, I'm sure there are purists or people who have an idea of what they would like Harper to be. And I've done other shows like that too. Like I did mm-hmm. a Sean O'Casey where people said I was too modern for the role and everything. And it's like, well, mm. I am the person playing this role. So yes. I'm going to do what I do, the very specific thing that I do. And if you don't like that, then mm. you have to you know, go and find the production where right. somebody is doing what you want. But I feel like my Harper is also like of the Time's Up movement, you know? It's yes, a politically, it it's quite a... Well, this, this play is perfect for now. Yeah, That's stepping out ever. from under being, like apologizing for yeah. ourselves and... There you go. You know, trying to get somebody to love you or something. Like it just, it's at a certain point, you just have to walk away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Way to bring it full circle. That was amazing for, oh, your, thank you. for your work. And thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's great. This I love awesome. it. I'm talking about myself. My favorite? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City. Thanks, as always, to producer, editor, and all-around podcast whiz, Jamie Muffet. You can follow him on Twitter at JamieMusicNYC. You can follow me, Jack Smart, on Twitter at JackSmartWrites. Thank you to the team at Backstage, a.k.a. the most trusted name in casting, 
Peter Rappaport, Mark Stinson, Francis Ramos, Rowan al Khatib, Caitlin Watkins, Lauren Rout, and especially Tony nominee of my heart, Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope.